Good morning and welcome to Park Hill Baptist Church. My name is Joseph Breckenridge and I'm the pastor of Connections and Children's Discipleship here at Park Hill. And whether you're attending with us in person or online, we are glad that you are here with us this morning and we would love to connect with you. So if you're here in person in the seat back in front of you, there's a visitor card. Please fill that out and drop that in the offering box on your way out the door. If you're with us online, head on over to our website, parkhillbaptist.com, and fill out one of our Connections cards there. We would love to know that you were able to join us in service this morning. I do want to let you guys know that upcoming in just a few weeks, we're celebrating a very important holiday, and that is, of course, Easter. So we have a few Easter activities I want to let you know of. The first one is on the Saturday prior to Easter. So that's going to be Saturday, April 3rd at 10 o'clock in the morning. We are going to be having an Easter egg hunt here at the church at Park Hill. This is for our children's ministry. So we're gonna have a time where we hear our Easter story and a time of egg hunt, and we are just going to have a good time. So try to make sure that you're able to be there. Then on Sunday, April 4th, Easter morning, we are going to be having two Easter services here at Park Hill. And if you're comfortable attending, we would love to see everybody here in person. So we're going to be having a service at both 9.30 and 11. And if you're planning on attending one of those services, please make sure you sign up on our website so we know who uh, is going to be where and how many seats we'll have available. So head on over to our website, parkhillbaptist.com, and it's the first thing you'll see on our website. Go in there, put your name, select how many people will be coming with you and what service you're coming to, just so we know. But now, let us stand together as we worship our Lord together. You heard him. He said, let's stand together. We're glad you're with us. Good to see everybody. Let's sing together. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene.
Amen. I'm glad you're here with me with us this morning, and uh, let me be the third to welcome you today. As my mask gets caught on my, it's just going to hang there. I don't know what to do. It's just going to be there. I know this is embarrassing. Okay, we're just going to let it happen. Um, we're going to pray anyway, so everybody just close your eyes. You don't have to worry about it. Um, <laughs> so before we uh, have a time of worship, we want to enter to a time of silence and confession where we can be still before the Lord. And i um, so thankful that you're here. I know for many it's a spring break week, and so many of our church members are traveling, so we want to lift them in prayer. And uh, some are not able to travel this week. Uh, you're, you're stuck here because you don't get a spring break, and so we're, we're praying for you. And for some of you, you just have a job, and they don't give you a spring break, period. And so you're jealous of all of us that get a spring break. Um, but we do want to continue to pray for those who are traveling this week, and just so thankful that God is uh, continuing to bring, allow us to come together uh, in person, and for those of you who are online, we're glad that you're here as well. So let's, uh, let's have a time of prayer and be still before the Lord as we enter into our time of worship. Will you join me? King Jesus, we thank you for your grace. And as we enter into your presence, having confessed our sin to you, confess that we are sinners and that we're born in sin, but by your grace we are saved. So we confess where we've come from, we celebrate where we are, And we're hopeful of where we're going. So, Lord, we stand today a redeemed people, washed new and made clean by the blood of the Lamb, by your sacrifice on the cross. So, Lord, we ask for your grace. Help us to worship you in spirit and truth today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's stand together.
temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll call on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll call on you. Jesus, you're my and open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2 is where we're going to be this morning. Before we dive into our text, um, I want to let you know about something that's going to be happening in the next couple weeks. So, you know, the, the Christian life is hard, uh, just like any life is hard, but the Christian life is hard for a couple reasons. One, uh, we are taking a stand against the enemy of this world, and in Christ we are seeking to live out a life of righteousness. And so we need our church body to help us to be able to do that, right? I mean, we need, there's, we need to be in community. And one of the things that we do, we, we encourage people to do, is that if you've, over the last year or, um, or so, you've started coming to Park Hill, you've been a part of this community, but you haven't found your way into a life group, uh, a small group of some sorts, a, a group of believers that will help you be able to stay connected, uh, here's what we want to invite you to do. Is we want to invite you to take a first step with us. And First Steps is a, is a one-week course uh, that we offer here at the church. It's going to take place the week after Easter. And it's going to be an opportunity for you, if you're not already connected, maybe you're not a member, or maybe you've joined in the last several months, um, but you're wondering, how can I get more involved? How can I uh, plug in? So First Steps is for you, and so you'll have a chance to register for that on our website and let us know that you're coming. But that's going to be the week after Easter. We're going to have that on the Sunday morning. Uh, after the service, we'll have lunch. We'll be provided, and uh, we'll get you all plugged in and fill, uh, kind of filled in on what's happening here at the church, how you can be a part of what God's doing here. So make sure to make plans for that. So Ephesians chapter 2. Let me pray, and then we'll dive in together. Father, I thank you that you know every day that we live. Your word says that they're written in your books, that you know our past, our present, and our future. And Lord, we sit often not even knowing our present, unsure what, it, what all is happening around us. And so, Father, we lean on your wisdom, trusting you that you know the best. Lord, as we open your word today, we pray that our hearts would be open, our eyes would be enlightened to your truth. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever struggled with purpose? Like what you're called to do? Maybe you knew your purpose and then the season changed and now all of a sudden you're wondering, okay, what do I do next? Maybe um, illness hit. And so what you used to be able to do 
you can no longer do. Or maybe you grew up and what the purpose you thought you had when you were a kid no longer really makes sense. I know for me, when I was in college, uh, my purpose was all over the map, trying to figure out what is it that I'm supposed to be doing. And I was, you know, it's like throwing darts at a dartboard, trying to figure it out. And even as I've grown older, there's been times when I've had to wonder, okay, is this, is this what God's called me to do? Is this what, and wrestling with that purpose, and I always come back full circle, to know, God has called me to pastor, this is what God has called me to do. But there's this wrestling that happens in our life of trying to figure out what is it that God is wanting from me. And, and as a kid, as a high schooler and middle schooler, this was, you know, one of the big things that we were always kind of talk, talk to about and leaders were talking to us about was, you know, you got to find your purpose. You got to find your, your why. And you, know, you got to find the, what you're supposed to be doing. And so in my mind, in my, you know, little uneducated mind, I thought, well, okay, so there's one thing that I'm supposed to be doing, and if I don't figure out this one secret thing, then all of a sudden, you know, I'm, my life is without purpose. But God's hidden it, it's a mystery, and you're going to have to try to figure that out. And so I, I went through, as I was growing up, high school, college, and even into young adulthood, kind of with this anxiety about, okay, God, I, I want to figure out what is it you've called me to do, but you're being kind of silent on some things, and so I'm not exactly sure. And so this wrestling with purpose, right, of where do we find our purpose and how do we find what it looks like to live on purpose? Well, in our text today, Paul actually talks to us about purpose. He wants us to know that, in fact, you were saved on purpose and you were saved for a purpose. It wasn't by accident, and it wasn't by accident that God has given you specific tasks to accomplish here on earth. Now, what I can't do this morning is outline for each of us what your purpose is. That's not my role. What I'm proclaiming today is that God has a purpose. He has a plan that includes you. It includes what he's called you to do, and now... The question is, what is that? What is it that God wants you to do? And so hopefully at the end of this morning, you will be at a better place to begin to wrestle with what is it that God is calling you to in this season, right? Because the specific things that God calls us to do, they change with the seasons, right? They change with age, they change with uh, career, they change with children, they change with education, they a lot of things change but the core of what God has called us to do remains the same. And that's what we want to look at this morning. So Ephesians chapter 2, beginning here in verse 1. Before we can look at purpose, we have to begin with what is a very uncomfortable truth that we do not like to talk about in the church. We don't like to talk about it because it reminds us of who we were. It reminds us of who the world is. And it scares us just a little bit, and it should. But I think because we've seen maybe pastors and leaders sort of abuse this as a tactic to try to get people to make decisions, we can go the opposite extreme and feel like, okay, we should never even talk about the bad stuff. We only want to talk about the good stuff. But we want to be faithful to Scripture, right? And so Scripture is, has a lot to say about who we were, where we were headed, what life was going to be like without Jesus. And from time to time, it's good for us to reflect on the path we were on. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, it is good for you to reflect on the path that you are on. Because as followers of Christ, we believe in uh, stepping into reality. Whatever is real, that's what we want to accept. And if God says that this is real, then we accept it as truth. So listen to what Paul says here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you were dead. That's who you were. You were dead. And then he says, In your trespasses and sins in which you previously lived according to the ways of the world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working, 
in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. We were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. So the first thing that we can see this morning is that you and I were spiritually dead and speeding toward eternal death and separation from God. You and I were spiritually dead and speeding toward eternal death and separation from God. I don't mean that we were happened to fall into this. What I mean by this is that we were on a collision course and we were unwilling to move the wheel. When I was in college, I worked at a camp um, over the summer and one weekend there weren't any campers there and so one of the leaders had brought his little dirt bike motorcycle, and I'd never ridden a motorcycle up to that point, and so he said, hop on, give it a try. I was like, okay, I'll try it, and I uh, didn't want to, you know, seem weak or like I didn't know what I was doing. Like, I hopped on, like I'd seen him doing the movies, like, I know how to do this, so you're trying to find that, and like, he's like, that's, that's just a pedal, that's not the thing, so I'm like, oh, it's over here, and so I'm trying to start the, the engine, uh, and so I get it started, and he shows me, okay, here's the gas, all right, here's what you do, and, uh, and so I was like, all right, gas, and so I start, and I realize he never really showed me where the brake was. And so I'm barreling down this dirt road, and I'm trying to, I don't know how to stop. And so I get, start to panic and, you know, get a little squirrely and start heading towards some trees. And finally, I just lay it down and just, you know, slide into this tree, end up cutting up my legs. And the truth is, I was on a collision course with some trees that would have ended in, you know, probably a hospital visit. And for us, that is, that is the direction that we're all going on, right? So that is the path that all of us are on in our life without Christ. It is a collision course with death and separation from God, and there is no, no desire in us to turn away from that because the reason is because our hearts are inclined toward the flesh. They're inclined to do what we want to do. That's part of the sin nature that we have. That's the path that we're on. And someone might say, well, aren't there a lot of good people out there that, that, don't, you know, that don't love Jesus, that aren't saved? And I want to say, yeah, they're good people. There's a lot of good people in the church. You can do good things and still be on a collision course with death and separation from God because what God calls us to is not a life of goodness. Understand this. God is not calling you to be good to just do the good things. What God has called you to is a life that is completely devoted to him, that sees all of life as flowing from him and to him, that sees all of life as a response and a worship to God. And so I can do a lot of good things, help a lot of people, and have absolutely no regard for God in my life whatsoever. And so when we say we're heading toward this collision course with death, it's because this is the path of sin. This is what separation from God feels like. This is what moving away from God's love and grace is like. And that's the path that each one of us were on. Paul says here in verse 1, and you were dead in your trespasses. Notice that up to this point when Paul has used that little word in, he's always referred to being in Christ or in him. But now he says that we are in trespasses. So it's kind of like a, a geography thing, right? Uh, you could be in Arkadelphia, you can be in Little Rock, you could be in Arkansas. And Paul is saying that whenever you are in Christ, here's the path that you're on. But when you are in trespasses, when you're in sins, this is a different path that you're going to be on. That what Jesus is coming to do is move you from one locale to another. And every single one of us were in our trespasses and sins in which we previously lived according to the ways of the world. Some of your translations may say the age of the world. The idea is that the world is moving like a cultural river. It's all moving in one direction. And all of us swim in that river. The ways of the world, the age of the world, the age that we live in, all of us are being swept away by the sins that we live in, the sins that come with our time, 
the way that we disregard and ignore God, the way that our age does that, uh, we're being swept away by it. And so all of us, every single one of us, floating down this river, all of us, separated from God's good care. And where that river ends is in death and separation from God. Paul recognizes that there's a power that exists behind the scenes. Now, this power isn't on par with God. This power is uh, under God. It's less than God, but it's a power nonetheless. And he says, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedience. There's, there's a power, a force of some kind, which we would refer to as the devil or Satan, but there's this evil that is moving this cultural river forward, and the whole world swims in its waters. Paul, wanting the Ephesian believers to know that he considers himself a Jew, even a Pharisaical Jew, as a part of this, he says, we too lived among them. We all lived in this river, moving toward death in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath. So Paul is saying that under all of this, our desires and our thoughts, all sinful inclinations, all pointing to self, all pointing away from God, swimming in this cultural river that's moving toward death and destruction, that's where all of us are headed. That's the destination. And while we may want to take comfort in saying, well, you know, I grew up in a church or I was born, you know, in a, in a Christian family or something, Paul doesn't care about any of that because it's, it has nothing to do with your heritage. Paul had an incredible heritage. It has something to do with the fact that our hearts are inclined inward. And that sin permeates from our life. And Paul will say in Romans that the wages of sin, what sin gets paid for when we sin is the ultimately death. That death is the payment for sin. So we are sinful in nature, and Paul says, children of wrath. I told you this wasn't the fun part, right? Then I mentioned that at the beginning. You didn't believe me, but I was serious. So what do we do with this? Humanity wants to live a life without God because humanity believes the lie that Satan tried to use on Jesus, that you can have everything that you want apart from God. But the thing is, God won't stay out of the story. We do everything we can to say, God, we're, we're just fine in this river. We're getting everything. We're getting all our needs met. We're getting everything that we want. But God won't stay out of the river. He keeps throwing the life vest. He keeps throwing in things to rescue us. And the way that he does that, the way that God has chosen to rescue us from this river leading to death and destruction, Paul describes in verse 4. And I love this phrase. We were headed to death and destruction, children of wrath, but God It's God who made a decision. It's God who decided to rescue. It's God who stepped into this uh, scary, deadly place and decided to rescue us out. It's God who did this. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. So Jesus came into death, and he rescued us out. Jesus led the dead out of the grave. He went into the cultural river, and he bore all the sin and all the judgment and all the shame upon himself so that he may rescue you out. So here's the second point. God loved you so much that he saved you. And he seated you with Jesus. 
the truth is that the future looked really bleak. There was no hope but God. God did something. And here's the kind of God that he is. Paul tells us. He says that he is rich in mercy. That he just pours forth mercy. That he makes us alive with Christ. He's a life-giving God, even though you were dead. He's a grace-giving God. He gives his presence where his presence is not deserved. You were saved by grace. This is the kind of God that saved you. Well, you may be asking the question, I just don't believe that God would judge people like that. That doesn't seem to line up with my view of God. But the truth is, if God didn't judge sin, he wouldn't be much of a God, right? If God just allowed evil to continue in the world, we would say, well, that's not much of a God. That would just ignore evil. We just don't like it when his wrath is pointed at us. I'm a good person. But if we remember that sin is really about a heart that is in alignment with God that's turned and now it's focused on the world or focused inward, we understand that sin is not just about me doing some good things and some bad things. It's about a heart that has been redirected away from its maker. But some of you, you don't wrestle with the idea of wrath because you, you get that, right? I mean, you, it, some things are just kind of black and white. You do wrong, God's going to judge it. What you struggle with is the second verse or the second part, which says that God loves you so much that he gave his son to die for you. God couldn't love me that much. God doesn't know all that I've done. There's no way that I'm good enough to deserve that. You're right. That's why it's grace. You don't deserve it. And neither do I. None of us do. We have so conditioned our minds that nothing comes for free, right? Uh, Which is a good rule of thumb to live by, but it's really bad theology. Because there is one really important thing that comes for free, and that is the grace of God. It is a gift. And the reason it's a gift is so that no one can boast about how good they were. God saw us drowning in that river, and he didn't say, well, what, show me what you can do. You know, do some flips or something. Oh, there's some good ones. Let me rescue them. I, God didn't care. The point of his grace is that he loves you For no reason in and of yourself. He just loves you because you're you. Because he made you. Because he cares. He's a God who's rich in mercy and of love. I'm one that has struggled with this idea that God could love me. But let me tell you what has helped me. Is that, one, you've got to kind of wrestle with the truth. Like, God says he loves me. Okay, I'm going to live as if that is true. Right? So I, I practice just living that, that reality that God loves me. Okay, if God says that he loves me, even though I don't feel it all the time, I'm going to live as if it's true, that God absolutely is crazy about me. And then secondly, I want to spend time in his word, allowing him to speak his love over me on a regular basis. And number three, I want to confess my love back to him. God, I love you. I love you. There's something about telling God that we love him, that our hearts are open to him, that we begin to have our hearts open to receiving his love back. Now, you may experience that in different ways, and there may be some other things that help you, but those are some things that have helped me. So you've been saved by grace, so there's nothing that we can do to boast. And so Paul here is saying in verse 4, God, who's rich in mercy... He's made us alive, and I love what he says. So just like in chapter 1, Jesus uh, dies, he goes into the grave, he's resurrected, and then he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, check this, because this, this will blow your mind. Are you ready? You missed it the first time, but here it comes. He who raised us up with him. So Jesus died and was raised. He says that somehow in this mystery of, of God's divine plan, We have been raised with Jesus, but he doesn't stop there, and seated with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. Jesus, who was raised from the dead, 
our spirits have been raised in Christ. We now have new life. And you are seated. Paul here is looking out into eternity saying, okay, here's the reality. I know you don't feel it right now. I know you don't see it right now, but here's the reality. You've been raised with Christ and you have been seated with Jesus in the heavens in Christ. You are a ruling part of what God is doing in the world. You are part of his a uh, good part of sitting at God's right hand with Christ. That's the status that you hold in Jesus. That you in Christ sit at God's hand. Think about that for a moment. You're not some peon that God just happened to have saved and then doesn't know what to do with you. In Christ, you have been raised and seated with him in the heavens. So that in Christ, it's nothing, we can't boast about this, and we certainly can't be proud about it, because it's all God's doing, but he has raised us up and said, you are mine, now help me rule. And we do this in Christ. Now, God doesn't need our help. Right? I mean, he doesn't need us. He didn't need to create us. He doesn't need relationship from us. He doesn't need anything from us. But he's chosen to take his creatures to raise us up and to give us authority and power and to say, I want you to rule and to reign. Now, what does ruling and reigning look like in this kingdom? Well, it looks like being the least. It looks like being the servant. It looks like loving our neighbor. It looks like sharing the gospel. It looks like standing up to the forces of evil. It looks like doing all these things we've talked about in previous weeks. That's what it looks like now. But God has seated us in the heavenlies. That's who you are. Told you you missed it. Got it now. Verse 7, so we were heading down a path toward destruction, but God, who is rich in his mercy, saved us. But the last thing I want you to see is that God loved you so much that he gave you an inter- eternal purpose to fulfill. God gave you an eternal purpose to fulfill. He says in verse 7, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, for you were saved through faith. He he mentions it again. It's not of your works. It's not anything of yourselves. It is God. It's a gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship. Let me just pause on that word for just a moment. That word workmanship, uh, some have said it, it, it... it's kind of like the word, uh, it's from the Greek word poema, which sounds like poem, but it's God's, wor- we are God's work, his craft, that God is working on us, that he's shaping us, that he's molding us, that we are his treasured possession, we, we are his canvas, we are his poem, we are his carving, we're his pottery, he's shaping us and molding and, and maneuvering so that we may reflect his glory in the world. God is intimately involved in your life, shaping and molding. And God is doing this not just just for your benefit, but because he has something for you to do. Look what he says. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now, Paul makes a difference between works which are done in the flesh and good works which are done when our hearts are in alignment with Jesus. When we're worshiping Jesus and we're doing good things, Paul says, that's great, keep doing that. When we're doing works that are maybe considered good by the world standard, but our heart's in alignment with Jesus, he says, that's the works of the flesh. That doesn't accomplish anything. That's not what we're called to do. But good works are those works that don't bring glory to ourselves. It's when we're abiding in Jesus and we're doing what God has called us to do He says, those have been laid out by God for you. God has good works for you to perform. Even so, God prepared them ahead of time for you to do. God has prepared certain works for you to perform. 
and God has, was able to take into account every twist and turn of your life, every up and down, every sin and fall away, every uh, you know, season of rejoicing and prayer, uh, every relationship, every job, every no matter where you're at in life, every health crisis, all those things, God has taken them into account, and he says, hey, I have some good works for you to do. Well, you don't know my situation. I thought I knew my purpose, but now my situation has changed, and God says, I, I have good works for you to do. I have things that I want you to accomplish. I have things as, as one who is seated in the heavenlies with me. I have some things, my child, that I want you to do. I think whenever I was younger, I thought this idea of one purpose, one thing that I'm supposed to do. Well, while, while that sounds good, I don't know that it's really biblical. Because the truth is, God has many things for us to do. And you may have one thing that you're really good at that God will use for the majority of your life, and praise God for that. You have a talent or gift that you can bring to the world. But the truth is that in your life, you're going to have seasons where you'll use your gifts and talents, and seasons <clears throat> maybe like Paul where you're locked in a prison, and all you can do is just pray and write a few letters. But God can still use you. In fact, God has prepared good works for you to do. So that when you wake up tomorrow morning, you can know, based on the authority of God's word, that God has good works for you to do. He has something that you can do tomorrow, today, that will have an eternal impact. You say, well, how do I know what it is? You just abide in Jesus. You just stay connected with him. You, you spend time in prayer. You're asking God to give you you open your eyes and you, you walk with Jesus and then you live your life and then God does the rest. When he opens a door, you step through it. You don't have to anxiously look, what's my purpose? What am I supposed to be doing? Who can I share with? I gotta share with somebody. Who's it gonna be? No, you just abide in Jesus and you pray and you be open. God has prepared these good works. He's not expecting you to find them. And some of you will be brought into situations where you can make a, a really immediate, an immediate difference in the life of a lot of people. And some of you, what you do in your life will not really be evident for hundreds of years. Or maybe even until we get into eternity, then we'll see just the impact that God had you to make. Which one is better? Um, if they're both in Christ, then they both have eternal impact and they both have the same weight. The world would say, if you don't make an immediate impact, then you're doing something wrong. Christ says, let's make an eternal impact instead. So God loved you so much that he gave you an eternal purpose. So as I said at the beginning, you were saved on purpose and for a purpose. He's prepared works for you and I to accomplish. So what's your purpose What is it that you have been called to accomplish? What is it that God has placed in front of you? He wants you, maybe it's your family, maybe it's coworkers, maybe it's sharing your faith, maybe it's teaching a Bible study or helping uh, people in need. I, I don't know what it is that God has put immediately in front of you, but there's something, because God has prepared good works for all of us. So I want to invite you to enter into that, to enter into whatever it is that God has called you to do, because the, the truth is that God's purposes are bigger than ours. And even though we may think we know what our purposes are, God knows instead. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are with us and that your purposes are true. And God, it doesn't matter how ineffective we feel we are or how Far we, f we drift from the ideal of who we want to be, Lord, you are there and you're calling us to good works. That you can use even the seasons of brokenness in our life to bring about your glory. So Father, we ask that you would speak to our hearts today. Show us the good works that you've laid out before us. Show us, Lord, that we don't have to make immediate impact. We need to make kingdom impact. 
And often that comes from loving our neighbor and caring for the poor and worrying for the widow. And Lord, all the things that the world may say, those, those don't have much value. But Lord, we know that in Christ, they make all the difference. So Lord, we trust you. And we ask that you speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and let's sing a song of reflection and response. And we'll respond to the Lord in song. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Thank you again for joining us this morning at Park Hill Baptist Church. I've got a few quick announcements before we wrap up. First, if you're a church member and you have yet to fill out the survey that our youth pastor search committee sent out, uh, please fill that out today. We are stopping submissions at the end of the day. So if you want your voice to be heard, make sure you get that filled out. Also want to let you guys know that this upcoming Friday at 730, uh, one of our Washtaw seniors, Andrew Cook, He's also been serving as one of our youth interns over the past few years. Uh, we'll be presenting his senior project here at Park Hill. It's going to be a night of worship, and it will be in person and online. So if you want to take part in that, it will be at 730 this upcoming Friday. Also want to remind everybody that our Annie Armstrong Easter offering is still happening. You can give to that the same way you give to our general offering. You can go online to our website, parkhillbaptist.com, and there is a Give button in the top right-hand side. You can give there. You can also mail a check into the office or swing one by the office while we're open. And we'll get that designated to either the general offering or the Easter offering, wherever you want it to go. And as we close today, uh, take a look at this video and learn more about Annie Armstrong and what the North American Mission Board does. But we will see you guys next week. God bless. I want to tell you a story. It's a story about people who do some of the hardest, most important work on earth. They start churches in places where people tell them, we don't need church. They provide food and shelter for families who don't even have the basics of life. They share the gospel everywhere for everyone. They are North American missionaries. It's always been hard doing what they do, but it's not always been like this past year. When the world shut down, the easy thing for them would have been to wait, hold off, or to stop. But that didn't happen, and it never will. Because for your North American missionaries, the mission always moves forward. We're still sharing the gospel. We're still impacting lives. We're still here. We never stopped. Right now, your North American missionaries are adapting. They're innovating. 
They're coming up with new ways to take the gospel into places it's never been before. You can do that when you have tens of thousands of people like you who give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Ministry costs money, and so your giving enables us to continue to spread the good news of the gospel. You see, no matter what's happening around us, when the world says stop, God always says go. That's why we're seeing new churches planted, we're seeing needs met, and we're seeing believers baptized. It's what happens when God's people give, pray, and go. Thank you for praying for your missionaries because prayer is powerful. And thank you for giving to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. As you do that, you provide the fuel that moves the mission forward. There's so much work to be done. Now, more than ever. It's estimated that there are 275 million lost people in North America. And so, what happens next in this story is up to you.